Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. We had never had a really, never lost a job, never had any real illnesses, never really had any real financial concerns, just kind of went along. Things happened, things happened well. Uh, didn't, lo didn't lose a child. We had friends who had all those th things happen to them and how lucky we were. And I'd always tell Mary Kay, one of these days, something's gonna happen. In 2005, I went in for just a routine annual physical. Uh, a few days later, the doctor called me. Uh, he calls me and Mary Kay and I in one day and says, you've got cancer. Well, uh, I've never heard those words, but when you hear those words, you've got cancer, your world changes. And I'll admit, when, it, when I heard those words, I thought my first reaction was, you know, why me? I mean, you know, I've done all, I've taught this class all these years, I've really served this church, and why would, it, why would I get chosen for this problem? Well, and that's when grace began to really, really show, show itself, because that attitude lasted about 35 seconds maybe, and then I said, why not me? I've got a prayer support team of friends, that wonderful friends who will pray for us, and I serve a mighty God. And so let's just, let's just take the steps and let's see what we have to do to get, to get this beat back. So what that taught me, the whole experience taught me that I am not in charge. And until that time, I'm kind of a type A guy and kind of do what I want to do. And I've always kind of figured things out. But when you, when you hear those words, you can't do that yourself. You have to depend upon God's grace. Continue to lean on God because once you learn that it's not about you and you're not in charge, it just becomes easier to say, okay, that's it. Somebody else is in charge and I'm gonna do what, do what I'm told to do. Really all of life, if you live long enough, I guess comes down to that. You start to realize I'm not in charge. Somebody else is. And I'm just going to do what I'm told to do. You know, submission, uh, self-denial, that kind of life is not, I mean, those aren't values uh, of North Dallas. Not really. I mean, let's be honest. None of us really like to just die to ourselves, submit, and just say, I'm not in control anymore. And I, I am out. Most of us, not unlike Duke, I think all of us in varying degrees, we, we want to lead our own lives. All of us do. And yet you start to realize that, you know, there's something greater going on in this world, and it's God who is actually in control of all things. And he works through all things. Praise God, Duke is doing well now in terms of health and all those things. He's teaching a class today, a great class. He's teaching the Word of God. But, but, you know, it's times like that where you start to realize, if you've been like our family, some of you have experienced that, where you get, you know, you hear the C word or you, 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 you encounter something that you go, I, this, is, this is a game changer. And, and you start to realize, wow, maybe I'm really not in control of my life. I wonder, do you ever feel like um, you, you're not enough? You can't do enough. You can't be enough. Isn't that all of us, really? I mean, don't you feel like your life often is driven by so much, um, gosh, comparison that leads to envy, leads to anxiety? You ever feel like you're not enough? I think all of us do. And here is the truth. The gospel, the Bible, agrees with you. There's a reason you don't feel like you're enough. Newsflash, right? You're not enough. You're not enough. And until we figure that out, and if that sounds like bad news to you, then you haven't fully comprehended the gospel. Friends, listen, when you come to the, to the point that Duke's talking about, which is, I'm not in charge. I can't do enough. I can't do anything about this. That is actually a liberating moment. But you say, well, what's, what's the fallback? If I'm not in charge, what, what do I do? What do I bring to the mix, right? And again, the thing here in North Dallas in particular is 
uh, I want to bring to the table. You know, just tell me the scorecard. I'll work harder, get better. I can bring something to the table. And what we're going to learn today is what the reformers rediscovered, what the scriptures teach us. I say rediscovered in many ways, as if new uh, for the first time ever for most. And that is that grace alone is what saves us. So we're going to talk about this thing of sola gratia. We're walking through the series. You can see there uh, the next 500. This is the 500th year anniversary of the, of the Great Reformation. Last week we dove into this. Uh, so I'll give you an edited version of a bit of history. You, you know that the key figure in the Reformation, he wasn't the only one by a long shot, was Martin Luther. Uh, some of you know in 1517 on Hallow's Eve, what we now call Halloween, um, he posted his 95 theses, 95 grievances against the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was the church in essence. Uh, there was the Eastern Orthodox Church that was not under the, the papal authority, the Pope as the final authority, by the way, not scripture, but Pope and traditions of the church. Um, in fact, one of the reformers, uh, whose name was Minno Simmons, uh, you've heard of Mennonites, Minno Simmons, he became a priest and was quite the reformer, but he became a priest and would later write that he had never read the Bible. He was a priest, and he had never read the Bible. He understood Catholic theology and traditions and history and such. He understood indulgences. He understood all of that, but he had never read the Bible. Because, you see, the Bible was written in Latin. And it was not yet translated into the vernacular of the people throughout the Roman Empire in, in most cases. And so it was only the priest, the pope, the papal authorities who could understand scripture. And so the people, the laity, right, the, the, the commoners would come and they would be told essentially, here's how you achieve salvation. One of the great challenges in that day, uh, or, or, or main teachings of the church was that of indulgences, that you could actually pay for your sins, literally pay for your sins. If you did something wrong, you could pay. And that money then would go to the church. And St. Basilica, uh, or St. Peter's Basilica, was being built in Rome during that time. Lots of that money was going that way. The church had, had gone so far off course that it was essentially this grand money-making enterprise. And what happened then, Luther post his 95 theses. He wasn't looking for a, for a real argument. I guess he was looking for a bit of debate. It was his way of, of posting to the public uh, square. It was like posting you know, on social media today, I guess. You, know, you, you tweet something. Uh, President Trump tweets something to his 40 million followers, and it kind of shakes the, the world, right? Um, little did Luther know that he would post his 95 theses, and that would be the spark of this great reformation that would change the world, literally. It would change uh, Europe, uh, it would change all of Western Europe, and ultimately come to us, and it would change the world. What we noted was, last week, and just to catch you up a bit, every 500 years throughout history of the church, um, a major shift takes place. So we have first Christ, the Christ event, the great salvation that comes to us. Christ splits history into B.C. and A.D. 500 years later was the fall of Rome. And I'm going to buzz through this a bit. And then uh, 500 years later, 1054, the great schism where the church split east and west. There was the great uh, schism of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Again, no longer under the Roman Empire. There was a single church. But now... We see the first split. We're going to see lots of those. The Protestant Reformation would come 1500, 1517. And uh, from that then spurred all kinds. You know why we have so many denominations in the world today? Some of you say, that's nuts. That's crazy stuff. It's really because of the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation brought about a renewed uh, understanding and rediscovery of the gospel. So every time the church goes through this great upheaval in history, there's this this, this encrusted, kind of hard shell of an institutionalized church that is broken, even shattered, and out of that comes this new life. And it's always going back to the gospel, back to the Bible. So the Reformation was really a rediscovery of Scripture. And out of it came then the, the uh, Scriptures translated into the language of the people, and people like Martin Luther would read it. He understood. He was brilliant mind, by the way. He knew Latin. He, he read the Scriptures, and in it, he discovered that there was a salvation that would come, not by works, what he'd been taught all of his life, but instead it was by, by faith. It was grace 
through faith in Christ and what he's done for us. And so last week we noted that probably the, the one, one verse that jumped out at him, um, we'll look at here in just a moment, but I want you to see really an outline. It's, it's the five solos that we're looking at this month, and I hope you won't miss a day, uh, miss a Sunday, because they're all so critical. You can see them there. Today we're looking at grace alone. Uh, next week, faith alone, all right, sola fide, then Christ alone and glory to God alone. You can see that the next three weeks really are tied together. We're going to make some distinctions here because there are those. Grace, faith, Christ, and all of this to the glory of God alone. So Luther, um, when he came upon Romans chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, for in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Another way to say that is from faith to faith, first to last. It's all faith. It's not works. There's nothing else. It's faith to faith. And as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. When he discovered that it was not his own righteousness, but what he called an alien righteousness, a righteousness from outside of us, it changed his life. He had a, he literally, he said that when he saw that and understood it, he was born again. Or his own words. He's a priest. He's been at it for a long time. He's a university professor in Wittenberg. And he's teaching. He's, he's, he's leading uh, people in the church. And, and, and yet he discovers the gospel. And he says when he, when he, when he saw that, when he realized that what, that what he called ex, extra nos, outside of us, there's a righteousness that comes to us that makes us right before God that, is, that has nothing to do with what we bring to the table. He said it changed his life. You know, many of us who, who grew up in the church, not all of us have, but when you come to discover grace, I've been asking a lot of people this week uh, when I'm with different people just to get the stories, hey, tell me when you first really grasped grace, when you really understood it. And what happens, a lot of people who grew up in the church miss it along the way. Either that's, well, we're kind of young to understand all that, and we come to understand it later. I know for me, I was not unlike Luther. I was saved. I was passionate about the Lord. Um, uh, but I mean, unlike Luther, I came to Christ when I was young. I understood the gospel. But then when I was about 30 years old, I had what I call a grace awakening, where I came to understand that I am fully loved, totally forgiven, completely accepted by God, that I've been covered in his righteousness, that there's nothing I can do to, to, to add to the mix. The only thing that we bring to our salvation is our sin that makes it necessary. And when you grasp grace, it changes everything. Grace changes everything. And that's what it did for Luther. So what drove him then, he wanted everybody to understand this. And he thought it a crime that the, the, the Pope, the church, was, was keeping the scriptures from the people to discover this kind of thing. And so it made him crazy. And he then uh, published, uh, over time his, his work was published, not by himself, but others. The 95 Theses ran, his grievances against the church ran, and he lit a fire. And so today, let's talk about this critical doctrine of sola gratia, grace alone. You can go ahead and turn to Ephesians 2, if you will. And we're going to land there here in just a moment, but let me continue to set this up as we walk towards it. This is such a powerful word for us today, and my prayer has been that you'll grasp this grace of God like never before. Quite a daunting task for me. In, uh, in a few minutes to talk about the greatest doctrine known to us, the greatest news that could come to us, that it's by grace alone that we're saved. Sola gratia. This is a critical doctrine because it distinguishes the true gospel, the biblical gospel, from all the other false gospels. Galatians was another book that changed Luther's life. If you've ever read Galatians, he says, who tricked you to think there's another gospel? than the one we've already preached, is what Paul says. And what we do in our church today, in, in I should say the modern church, many of us do, we, we add to what Christ has done. We think that perhaps it's Jesus plus something. It's Jesus plus my own works, or Jesus plus my ideas, or my history, or what I think is Jesus plus something. And instead, we realize, no, it's grace alone. Let's try to figure out what all this means. This is such a critical doctrine also because um, it, 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 it secures your salvation. The assurance of your salvation comes through grace alone. With many of us, our stories are, well, I came to Christ or I thought I did, or, but I am not sure that I'm saved. Even today, I wrestle with that a bit. 
And, you know, I saw this a lot in youth ministry where students would come, having come to Christ as kids, and then somewhere in the mix they'd say, I'm not sure I'm saved. I think I... Uh, how, why, would a, why would a saved person, a Christian, be doing what I'm doing? And we have this uneasiness. We doubt our salvation that Christ has already accomplished in, uh, for us. Because I think it's a lot of times we think we can bring something to the table. And do I have enough works? Do I have enough faith even? How much faith do I have to have in order to know that I'm saved and have the assurance of my salvation? These are all questions that we wrestle with. And today, I hope we can settle a lot of this. So here's the great need. You see, the opposite of grace is law. So next week, we're going to look at this thing of faith alone. The opposite of faith, you could say, is doubt. But really, the opposite of faith is is works. Uh, Today, the opposite of grace is the law. Now, the law is God's holy demands that He's placed on all of us. The Bible says that we cannot... Uh, live up to his holy demands. They are crushing. And, and so the law is not just, well, look at the Ten Commandments and all that's laid out in the, Old, in the Old Testament. The law is a reference to all of God's holiness that he would require of us. And the Bible says in, in Romans 6.23, perhaps you know this. Let's read this together, this verse. You can see it on the screen. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word free gift is the word uh, charisma. So in the Greek, the word is charis. Maybe you know that word. Uh, charis is gift. So here it's charisma. It's kind of a redundant, free gift, free grace. Uh, we talk about free grace. That's, that's a redundant statement because grace by nature, by definition, is free. Or it's not grace. It becomes a wage, right? And so when we talk about grace, it's a completely free gift. Nothing that you do other than simply receive it. Now look at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 10. This again is a, is a well-known passage for a lot of us. Maybe too well-known. And I want us to unpack it today. It says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unpack this uh, and then apply it. If you take notes, you can write these down along the way. But what the law could not do, grace does. Let's talk about what grace does. And we see it here. We could go to a lot of passages. In fact, probably more cross-references today than normal. But I want you to say, first of all, what does grace do? Grace rescues. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. That word, we know that word. It's, It's saved. It's rescued. We're rescued by grace. Grace is the means of our salvation. You could say that grace is the means, it's, it's, and faith is the door through which we walk. Grace is what Christ has done for us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you're at your worst, friends, this is still true. While you're at your darkest, while you're at the furthest you can possibly be, and this is a word for someone today, there's no sin that you can commit that will, that will outstretch the, the, the grace, the arm, the loving arm of God. The only sin that is unforgivable is a rejection of His grace. Rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Grace comes while you're at your worst, at your darkest moment. This is really good news. Grace is preemptive. Grace makes the first move. Grace is one-way love. Grace comes to us not because we deserve it, but because it is just that. It's a gift. That we don't deserve. Well, look at this. Also, grace finishes. Secondly, grace finishes. Look at what it says. It says, it is by grace that you have been saved. It's done. Once received, it is finished. The gospel is not a first step in a stairway of moral living. It's instead of a complete immersion into a sea of grace. You know, a lot of us, I think our struggle is not that we don't believe. I'm speaking to church folks. Not that we don't believe that we are saved by grace because, you know, my first question, don't you feel like often that you're not enough? We all do. Uh, Every person on the planet feels that they're not enough. And there's a reason for that. Again, because we're not. That should draw us to God or seek 
help and seek rescue somewhere, and it does. It, it causes us to run to all kinds of places. It's why we, we act so crazy as human beings, always seeking to justify ourselves. And we're going to talk about that next week. But grace uh, frees us from that because we see that it's finished, the work that Christ has already done for us. The problem with many of us is not that we're, we don't believe that we're saved by grace, but we don't believe that we're saved by grace alone. And so I want to talk about that. We, we tend to want to bring something to the mix, and we realize we can't, that, that, that we're, 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 we're helpless. God has saved us single-handedly, I could say. Grace is one-way love. And because of this, look at this next point, grace humbles us. Grace, another way to say this, grace humiliates us. Grace means that I can't bring anything to the mix. And for most of us, a lot of us, that's too much to bear. We can't handle that kind of humility. Grace humbles us. It says this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. See, grace, the gospel, heralds the great reversal. And it's this, acceptance before achievement. It's mercy before merit. How about this? It's grace before any good works that we might bring. Grace is preemptive love. And this is very good news. Grace is scandalous because it removes us from the mix. And this has never happened before. There's no other religious uh, framework, no other teaching on the planet that teaches this. It's why Luther was blown away when he read Paul's words, who also understood Paul said, Paul, the, the original reformer, or Christ, the great reformer. But Paul says, but now a righteousness has come that is outside of us. It's from God in Christ. That had never been, been known before. It had never been heard before. Every religious system on the planet is you do this and then God will do this. You do this and you'll make it there. And it never happens. And we all know it deep down. We've been hardwired this way. So grace liberates. Grace rescues. Grace finishes. Grace humbles. Grace liberates. It's not a result of works. It liberates us from this burden of being good enough. So grace unites us. This is a good word. Grace balances. Grace equalizes. How about that? We are all, and particularly in the church, those of us who've received God's grace, uh, we're all in the same same playing field. We're at the same place, same level before the cross. We're all in the same boat. We are rescued by grace and grace alone. We don't bring like a scale and say, well, I'm a bit more moral than you are. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit better off. I got better, you know. No, we're all in the same place. That's a freeing thing. See, grace liberates us. It, it frees us to be okay with not being okay. Grace means that we continue to struggle, but it's liberated us because it's not a result of our good works. Look at this next point here in verse 9. Grace silences so that no one can boast. Grace means we bring nothing to the table. The scripture teaches that even faith is a gift of God. We cannot boast. Now here's an interesting, important, I think diagnostic question that Paul is pointing to here. If it's not grace, then, and we'll unpack this a little bit more next week, where do you tend to run? to justify yourself? Where do you tend to run for your own kind of self-salvation project? If it's not grace, what do you boast in? See, your boast points you to your salvation. It points you to your God. And if we realize that it's grace alone, we boast in Christ alone. It's why we come together uh, in part, while we come together corporately, and when we worship, we boast in Christ. We boast in Him, not in ourselves, but in Him and Him alone. So, you know, in our culture, we're so obsessed with, with kind of a self-improvement. We just want to figure out how to get better, work harder. We bring this over into the church. But the Bible tells us that we are spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to add. I can't bring anything to the mix. And that should be a really freeing thing. It leaves the, you know, me out of the equation so I cannot boast. What is your boast? That's worth thinking about because that will point you to your idol, point you to your God. Look at this next one. Grace 
responds in verse 10. And this is love, not that we have loved God. This is, this is 1 John 4.10. But that he's loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation, the, the wrath satisfier for our sin. But it says here in verse 10 that we now are God's workmanship. Some of you know that word is poema in the Greek. Beautiful word where we, we get our word poem. We're God's poem. We're his artwork is what he's saying. And, and so now we are to, to present the beauty of his grace in the way that we live. We walk now, he says, in a different way. We now seek to obey God, not to gain his approval, but because we already have it. And so what we see here, grace responds. Grace silences. Grace responds. It responds to his grace by, through obedience and, yes, by offering grace to others. I say it often, we can now, listen, you can love others freely, make the first move, preemptive move, because all the love that you have, you have found in Christ. You can love others without any love in return. That is radical stuff. And when we do that, the world takes notice. You are free now to respond to his grace by outgracing others. Let me ask you, who in your life do you need to outgrace? And you say, well, they're not gracing me at all. That's the point of grace. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And he calls us to love others as he has loved us. We're always waiting on the first move. We're always waiting. Helmut Thielek, uh, who survived the, the horrors of Nazism, he, he's the one who said, I, I want to forgive. I'm always on the verge of forgiving, but I cannot forgive. I'm too just. Meaning they, somebody got to pay for something. Grace is preemptive. Who, whom do you need to love? And then watch for opportunities. With this on my mind so much of the time, I look for opportunities for someone who doesn't look like me, someone who's in need. And, and to step out and to speak to them, some word of encouragement, open the door for someone who, who maybe you would normally think, well, you know, you probably ought to be opening the door for me. I mean, that's kind of how prideful we are. But grace says, no, no, no. I'm going to love you. I'm responding to the grace of God because of God's great grace that's come to me. C.S. Lewis said it this way, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because Christ has forgiven the inexcusable in us. So friend, who do you need to, who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to call? Maybe write a note. Maybe it's somebody in your own family. Grace responds. What, what it says in Romans 6, 14, I love this. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. You see, we now have shifted. We've moved away from law. Now we live under grace. You say, well, how do I receive this grace? What's well, through faith. It's through faith, which means you simply surrender your life to the Lord. This is the hardest part for us. You surrender your life, and by faith, you, you receive it. You believe. And you say, believe, that's so hard for me. I hate the faith part. No, praise God for the faith part. Because it's only uh, this sense of, yes, Lord, I give up. I, I give you my life. Grace means that someone else is in charge. And he's in charge of your salvation, not you. And that is really good news. So all you do is surrender your life to him, and then... You, you, you believe it, you confess it, you proclaim it through baptism, you join the fellowship of the church, you, you unite with the body of Christ, and you grow in grace. I love 2 Peter 3.18, it says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. He says you're going to grow in grace. Isn't that interesting? We, we, we can't grow in terms of our works towards God, but we can certainly grow in grace, that it permeates every aspect of our lives. Think about the most gracious person you know, the most loving person you know. I got a hunch they have really grasped the grace of God that's been given to them. Lastly, grace motivates. 
This is so important. So grace rescues, it finishes, it humbles, it liberates, it silences, it responds. I'm, I'm kind of wanting to overwhelm you today with what grace does. We could go on and on, but grace motivates. Not only do we respond to his grace by extending grace to others, but you need to get this. But by grace, you see, it's grace that motivates these good works. We, we are now driven by this great love that's come to us. So love becomes our prime mover. It becomes the great motivator. There's no greater motivator, right, than love. So we respond. He's first loved us. Now we love him by being obedient and serving others. And so grace becomes our motivation. I could say it this way. Grace um, really motivates or, or drives what the law requires. Grace inspires what the law requires. How about that? Grace drives us to obedience. People say, well, you know, with too much, uh, too much uh, grace, you're going to have this license for sin. No, no, no. A person who, who, who is, has license for sin, it's not that they've taken grace too far. They haven't taken grace far enough. They haven't fully grasped what Christ has done. Now it's in response to him that we want to obey for all the right reasons, finally. Not to add to the mix, not to get better work harder, but to believe more deeply what he's already done. It's like this, students. It'd be like you going to a class, all of us, and the professor, the teacher says, hey, listen, first day of class, just want you to hang in here uh, for this class period, but I'm going to go ahead and say from the start of this semester, start of this class, everybody in here gets an A. Everybody is going to get an A. Now you're like, this is awesome. I ain't coming to this class anymore. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, and then you sit through the class. And it's the greatest class you've ever been to in your life. It's unbelievable. The things you're learning, the passion of this professor, all the, the knowledge that they're dropping on you is life-changing. And you can't wait to get back to the class the next day and the next day and the next day. This is the gospel. It starts with an A. And it gets better from there. And you don't want to miss out on all that God has for you and your life. So you can't get enough of the scriptures. You can't get enough of God's people. You can't get enough of this grace. Because grace, the gospel, is bigger than you've ever imagined. And everyone who receives Christ, you get an A. Not based on anything you've done, but because there's been one who's gone before you. Can I say it took the test for you, took the final exam, and he aced it completely. On your behalf, his grade becomes yours. The righteousness of God now covers you if you've received his grace. Friends, listen, there's no longer a scorecard. You're no longer in bondage to sin. So again, Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you. That we can actually live differently in response to his, his grace. Since you're not under law, but now you're under grace. Grace motivates us. Grace inspires what the law requires. Only grace, only the love of God and our love for him gives God-honoring animation to our obedience because now the Spirit leads us and we can overcome sin. We can live differently. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, chapter 3 and 4. I mean, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, are you getting this? In that it was weak through the flesh, God did, okay, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see, Christ's life lived perfectly. We say it often is just as central to your salvation as his death and resurrection. I could say it this way. We're not saved apart from the law. Think about this. Jesus came and he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. What did he mean by this? He said, I came to fulfill the law. We're not saved apart from the law. Instead, we're saved in Christ who lived the perfect life and fulfilled the law for us. So it's not like the law, God went, oh yeah, the law blew it. I messed up and all that. Sorry. I will just turn my back on your sin. No, no, no. He goes at it straightforward in Christ. He sends him. He lives the perfect life. And now we respond by seeking to obey. And we too can live holy lives 
and bring glory to him. Others see our good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. It's like this. The law is, let's, let's look at this, a train track. The law are the, are the tracks for the train. That's the law. This is how you're to go. And then if we're the engine, I guess, on the track, then, then the coal, the fuel that brings energy and mo- mot- motivation and movement, obedience, is grace. It's the gospel. It's the spirit in us that we receive when we receive the grace of Christ. When you become a believer, you have all that you need for, for, for a new way of living. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Here's what I'd ask you, friends. Has the grace of God come to you in vain? See, many of us today, we might say, well, Jeff, I'm I'm saved. I'm a believer. Uh, Let me ask you, has it translated to holy living? Are you pursuing the Lord? Are you in his word? Look at what Paul says. He says, it's not that then I just, you know, live like however I want to live. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Look at, he says that it's the grace of God in me that's motivating me to obedience. The gra- Really? Yes, the, a response to what Christ has done for me. Grace has come to us all, but has it come in vain to some? Paul says, not to me. I'm more active, I'm more alive, I'm more obedient than I ever thought I could be because of this grace that changed my life. So Martin Luther would say this as I close. The law says, do this, and it's never done. Grace says, believe in this man, and immediately everything is done. God's approval does not come from our improvement. Friend, be set free today. You already have his approval that leads us to improvement. It leads us to the life that he's called us to live. Our greatest need is not so much to look at our sin. Your great need is to look at your Savior and look at all that he's done for you. The more you behold him, the more you become like him. I hope that you've received the grace of God. It's the greatest gift known to man, and it is life-changing. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he, he said this, Run, John, run, the law demands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. Friends, grace changes everything. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.